I'm Darren Persinger, and I am a results leader. You're listening to ResultsLeader.fm. Being a thought leader is easy. Getting results is hard. This show is for the results leader who lives and dies by their results. Here is your host and chief results leader, Jonathan Rivera. You are listening to ResultsLeader.fm. Welcome back. So stoked that you're here. And today's guest is going to be extra very special. Yeah, I said extra very. He is a guy that has been in my life for for 10 years, has mentored me, has helped me. He's the reason that I'm still podcasting today. He's the guy that helped me get my real estate business under control and systemized. He's a good friend and my original partner on the Making Agents Rich show. Today's guest is Mr. Darren Persinger. Darren, my man, welcome to the show. So good to have you. What is up? Results leader. Yeah. Here's a secret, ladies and gentlemen, that you may not know. I think I talk about it in the results leader book. You do talk never, about it in the book. So get the book about it on the show. And that is I copped this name and this concept from Darren when we went and did Making Agents Rich together. It was one of the things he said to me. I don't want to be a thought leader. I want to be a results leader. And it always stuck with me. And uh, now I'm owning it. So thank you for that, Darren. I appreciate you, bro. Are you ready to do this? I'm ready. Yeah. Thanks for taking an idea and running with it because I wasn't going to do anything with it. You got so many ideas, you just throw them away. Yeah, So exactly. here's a quick win for our listeners. What book have you given most as a gift? The book that I've been giving the most as a gift probably over the last three years is Barking Up the Wrong Tree. Never heard of that. Can't remember who the author is, but it's basically, I've been giving it away to a lot of people that are either trying to start something new, so a lot of high school and college graduates, or people that feel that my perspective is that they're a little bit lost, they're wandering, they think they want to do something, but they're not quite sure. I'll hand them that book and say, read this and and make sure that you're chasing the right thing. Cool. Well, thank you for bringing that to the show. Tell me a story of how an apparent failure set you up for later success, Darren. Oh my gosh. I have so many, so many failures. I would say the biggest one was my real first serious firing where I thought I was going to be at the career until my death right? Like I'm from the time and age where you could still work with a company and then hopefully you just retire there and you get the gold watch and everything. So getting fired. And at the same time, shortly thereafter, the lesson that I learned was getting fired. I ended up in someplace better that I didn't even expect that I couldn't foresee because I was so stuck in this idea of I'm going to just move up the chain here and eventually run this place. So then getting fired helped me realize, oh, I can end up in someplace better. And then that led to like personal relationships with girlfriends, being okay with a breakup or make like, hey, this relationship isn't going to go anywhere. I'm going to break up with you because I know something is going to be better. I think for the first 25 years of my life, I was waiting and reacting to things like, okay, you're fired, you're dumped, this is over. And then trying to repair from that. And then I realized, oh, I can just quit things and move on. Because I'm always going to end up in a better career, better job, better business. I have my beautiful wife now. It always ends up better. So don't be afraid to be the first to take action on things. You don't have to wait around for someone else to make the decision for you. What would you say is the most worthwhile investment that you've ever made? You know, I know a lot of people say investments in themselves and stuff like that. But, and you can do some mental gymnastics to say, any type of investment is an investment in yourself. But I'd say the very first real estate investment that I made when I was first home I bought, it wasn't an investment, it was an owner-occupied duplex, but just pulling the trigger on that, not even understanding what real estate investing was, but trusting my brothers, trusting my dad, trusting this process of, hey, you don't need to see the full picture, understand how all of this stuff works. I mean, like, When I bought that, I was still asking the mortgage lender, what's an arm? I didn't understand what a mortgage was really. And I was already in real estate. 
but I still didn't understand the ins and outs. So it's just that first investment allowed me to just, I don't need to know how this entire thing ends up. I just need to take the first step. And I think that led to a, me being able to make easier investments. So that's why I would say that's the best investment. It's allowed me to make easier investments in things moving forward. What I hear you saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it sounds like you're painting a picture of having faith. Does faith play a part in your life at all? Or is it just you believe in yourself? I mean, what- I wish more. I wish I would play more. <laughs> it's so easy to doubt yourself doubt things around you, doubt others. And it would be easier to just have some faith in things, understanding that you can't have 100% of the answers. Hundred like Then what's there's no risk to anything. Like what's the point of doing any of this stuff if it's just coded out? So I'm trying to lean into faith even more, I would say, on this back nine of my life. And with a lot of big changes coming up, what I think Catherine would recognize this in me too. I'm more chill on, hey, something really good's going to happen out of this or something bad's going to happen and then something good will come from that bad. Either way, there's only so much I can control out of this. And so I wish the first 20 years of being in career, being professional, being an investor, I would have had more faith instead of just hustle and grind, but it's getting there even more. In the last five years, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? Okay. I would say I'll take you through one in the last couple months. This has been a huge game changer for me. Even though I'm drinking a coffee right now, it's a half-calf, and I only drink one of these a day. I was so addicted to caffeine, I didn't even realize it. With my sleep tracking, I know I fall asleep within eight minutes now. I used to lie in bed for an hour and a half either watching something, reading something, or just laying there staring at the ceiling. I get fall asleep faster, get better sleep. I wake up and I'm not droggy and tired and wore out when I wake up. So this is the first coffee that I'm having. We're talking at 8.30 my time. I've been up since six and I just thought I'd have it just for uh, the vibe while I'm talking to my friend right now. So ditching the caffeine habit has been huge. Did you say you're using a sleep tracker? Mm Mm-hmm. I have a watch that tracks my movement and stuff and then syncs to the phone. Interesting. And do you find yourself, uh, (laughs) depending on the results of your sleep tracking, to feel good the next day or what? Because that's what I used to do. I used to like look at it and be like, oh, thing says I didn't sleep well. I'm going to have a bad day. Not, I wouldn't, I would say it's not day by day. It's kind of like weighing yourself on a scale, you take the average over a week. So if I know that I'm getting some bad sleep day over day over day over day, and I'm falling behind, then I probably should sleep in or go to bed early and try to catch up on that. Otherwise, I can get a little short fused when I don't have the right amount of sleep. And so getting ahead of that, yeah, I think that's really important. But yeah, I wouldn't go look at it every day and go, oh, I only slept six hours. Because that's one of the things I would say I realized from sleep tracking. I probably only need six and a half to seven hours of sleep to feel really good. I'm not an eight hour, nine hour sleeper. What are some bad recommendations you hear in your area of expertise? Okay. So I'm in the real estate space and just, I would say, general small business, local service provider space. I try to be open minded about advice because I do believe the only thing that doesn't work is nothing. So if you find something that you're willing to take action on, go for it. But advice for real estate agents, the worst advice is like newbies. It's easy, get in, put your license under my brokerage or coaches are like, just sign up for my coaching program and you'll be making six figures this year and seven figures within three years. The advice is just making it sound like it's too easy. And then if I was to get drill into that a little bit more. I think advice for a lot of marketers is that you have to do video. I'm just not, and you know, I sell video programs and coaching. I just don't think everyone has to do it. Why not? If Stephen King, when he was trying to write his first book, went to someone and they said, well, look, you're not going to make any money being a writer. What you need to do is be an actor. You need to get on the screen or be a movie director or something. This writing thing, that's boring. No one really cares about who writes books. 
how many books would we not have and how many stories would we not have? Writing is Stephen King's genius. He does it. He does it really well. And I think when you tell someone, no, you must do this thing because that's a trend or the current fad, then you could lose out on a lot of greatness out there in the world. We interrupt your regularly scheduled program for a public service announcement. We're going to get right back into this show, but I wanted to ask you a question. If you have been listening to the show for any amount of time and you've picked up even one single tip, then I need your help. Get the word out. Tell people about resultsleader.fm. Share it on social media. Share it on your email. Share it anywhere. Hashtag resultsleader.fm. Now let's jump back into the interview. Now let's talk about results, Darren. Why do results matter? Hmm. Well, it's the only thing that's tangible. You got to pay the bills somehow. And I think inherently we know, we know the score, even if no one's keeping track of it. So we know the results that we're getting and that matters. I remember a basketball coach that I had in high school, we were running suicides. If you don't know what suicides are, it's down to the free throw line back, half court back, other free throw line back, full court back. And I just remember this statement pops up weekly in my head. He's like, if you don't run down to the line, touch the line and come back all the way, if you shortchange yourself, if you cheat, you're only cheating yourself. You're not cheating the team. You're not cheating me. You're cheating yourself. And I think that's what we look at with results. So yeah, you can have ideas, you can have theories, you can put a lot of stuff out into the world even. But if the result isn't allowing you to continue to do what you want to do, that's a problem. So example, I had a client that got really hooked on the influencer stuff with like TikTok because they'll give you a lot of audience. And he was doing a lot of TikTok and, and getting a lot of audience and doing a lot of Q&A, but none of those audience members were his primary target audience that was going to pay him money to provide his services to them. But he couldn't break free from that. He wanted to keep being the influencer and do the Gary Vee stuff. And eventually that meant he didn't get to do that and he didn't get to run his business where he was going to help people. So he had to go get a job in order to pay the bills. So no results. Even though you might think results, oh, my audience is growing up. There's more engagement. I'm basically a rock star here. The results will eventually disappear if they're not true results, if they don't allow you to keep doing the thing. You think he's doing TikToks on the job? I mean, if someone else will pay him, then I'm fine with that. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> oh, man. In the last five years, what new realization has helped you get better results for your clients? In the real estate space, helping buyers and sellers, just realizing how unimportant real estate is to them. We don't view, my wife is my business partner, we don't view real estate as the primary thing that someone's doing. We view it as secondary or tertiary, that they're buying or selling because there's something else going on in their life. So one, it's helped us get our ego out of it. And number two, being more of service to them of how do we make this thing easier to do because they have life going on. They have, they're moving across country because the husband's deployed in the military overseas. And so the mom is moving her and the kids across country by herself. How can we make that process easier? Or a landlord has a tenant that suddenly isn't there paying rent anymore. And they're not local. So how do they get their home ready for sale? Or someone was planning on making a move because their family's growing. And now something's happening during that birth that could cause a lot of heartache and difficulty. Are we worried about, hey, you need to be responsive to us and you need to do this by this time and do this contract? Or what can we do to make this process easier if they're sitting in the hospital in the NICU with their baby that might or might not make it. I think just realizing how, what we kind of think about it is the teacher that thought their class is the only class that you're taking and they just sign 
huge amount of homework to you and reading. It's like, I got other classes and I have another, some life outside of this too. And we just don't want, we've realized that, yeah, real estate's a big deal, but it's not the only thing that's happening in their life at that moment. What area of your business would you like better results? We are actually not great at lead conversion, but that's, that's because we are, mm, we're not going to chase anyone down. So we know that we leave a lot on the table, but we have enough. But every once in a while, I'll go, oh, I wish we were taking care of those people somehow, some way. So trying to balance out because we don't want to grow a team. We don't want to have to manage a bunch of other people. So just trying to balance that out. But we know that we're not great at lead conversion. But at the same time, that also allows us to be really good at what we do with our marketing. We know that we're not going to harass someone and do like a 12 days of torture on them and call them and text them three times a day until they convert. So we generate our leads accordingly. And we're not trying to generate a thousand leads to get a 1% conversion. We can do pretty well generating really good leads further down the line, warming them up before they even come into our into conversation with them. They're sitting in our ecosystem for a while. So knowing that we're not good at that allows us to, I guess, hide that weakness. What results are you most proud of? Our family, our kids. Our kids are amazing. Everyone likes our kids. And that's really important to me. I remember Jordan Peterson when Morgan was probably just like a year old or something, seeing a Jordan Peterson clip where he's like, you have until like age four or five until your kid's world is kind of shaped and that's going to be who they are. And if you don't enjoy hanging out with them, that probably means that other people aren't going to enjoy hanging out with them and other kids aren't going to enjoy hanging out with them. And then that's going to be a tough life for them. And I just really, it's nice to see how adults like our kids and other kids like our kids. And I think that has a little something to do with how Catherine and I engage with our kids and play with them and support them and, and push them in other ways too, that when they're uncomfortable. Beautiful, man. So any parting thoughts for the results leaders who are listening out there? Parting thoughts, I guess just from your questions, the one thing that kind of stood out to me was that that story that I told about the person that was getting caught up in the influencer stuff. Don't be seduced or tricked by results that don't matter. I think we the term would be vanity metrics type of things. You have to be able to connect those to your end goal of what are you really trying to achieve and focus on that because there's a lot of things that can show you that you're having some sort of positive result. But if it doesn't help you keep doing the thing that you want to do, it's not a result worth having. Check your results. That's what I'm writing down here. Are, are they the results you want? I love it, man. I know that our listeners will want to know a little bit more about you, dive into your work, get into your ecosystem. So where can they go? The best place to start is just with my website, darrenpersinger.com. And that kind of hubs off of everything into our real estate and in, into our marketing and coaching. Excellent. We will have links in the show notes. And that is a wrap for another edition of ResultsLeader.fm. If you are out there getting results for your clients and you want to be featured on the show, go to ResultsLeader.fm now and apply to be on the show. And if you love what you're hearing, share the show, give us a rating and review, do anything to help us get the message out there. Thought leadership is easy, but results leadership is hard. We'll catch you on the next one. This is the podcastfactory.com.